All right, everyone, welcome back. Welcome to day two. I hope class is going well for you so far. We're going to talk a little bit about aircraft certification today. This is kind of a tricky subject, but it's actually pretty interesting. You get to learn a lot about what makes an airplane an airplane, at least legally speaking. Now, the first thing that you're probably going to wonder is why you are looking at a picture of pie right now. Well, let me tell you exactly why. Here's the deal with aircraft certification. We need to have some kind of definition for the aircraft we're making. Now, picture this situation. I'm going to ask you to bring me a slice of cherry pie. Now, this is what I am picturing in my mind. Nice flaky crust, a little chewy, not too brittle. Nice tart cherries, a good sweet filling to go with it. Oh man, I can almost smell it right now. That is exactly what I want, and that would be just the exact thing that I want you to bring me. However, that's the only piece of information I gave you is that I want a cherry pie. Now imagine my disappointment if what you bring me is this. This poor, sad, destroyed McDonald's cherry pie. That's, that's not what we want. This is the issue with definitions. If I tell you that I want an airplane, let's say I, I tell you that I want a Cessna 175 built. Now, what I'm picturing is the well-manufactured, appropriately built Cessna 175 that complies with all of the different specifications that I have expected to see with this aircraft. However, unless I define it very specifically and make a point out of defining it specifically, then I could wind up with the McDonald's cherry pie of Cessna 175s that would be very questionable in its airworthiness. So let's jump over to our regulatory database here and we'll talk a little bit more about what all of this means. Now, when an aircraft is designed, this has to be regulated by the FAA. So we talked about yesterday uh, in our first day of class, when we build an aircraft without regulation, without some established procedures for what makes an aircraft safe, how it needs to be able to perform to be able to continue flying in an emergency or avoid cascading failures. We have to have a set of definitions and that's what the FAA provides. They tell us everything that goes into making an airplane an airplane. As an example, if we look at part 23 of 14 CFR, uh, which is governing the standards for normal category aircraft, what you'll notice in the list of subjects we have is a huge, huge and specific amount of regulations that cover each factor of how the aircraft operates, performs, and how it's constructed. We have everything ranging from cockpit voice recorders and flight data recorders to applicability for what a normal category aircraft is and how it's certified. We have information about performance in flight, weight and center of gravity, performance data, stall speed, takeoff performance, landing requirements. We have flight characteristics for controllability, trim, stability. We have information covering how the structures are built, what kind of loads are supposed to be able to take, the performance that they can take, the design of those structures. And we have separate sections that cover power plant, equipment, fuel, and how the flight crew interface with the aircraft. There is a huge amount of specificity built into how the FAA defines what an aircraft that falls in that type category should conform to. Now, what makes this interesting is when we build an airplane, we have to come up with our design, we go through the different prototypes, and we're trying to apply uh, eventually for what is an approved type certificate. So if it's the first type of airplane that we've ever built, we go through a process of testing, uh, usually under an experimental category, until we can establish that the aircraft performs the way it's supposed to and performs within all of the regulations that have been set forth uh, through whatever category we're trying to apply to. When that aircraft has been inspected by the FAA and we know that everything conforms properly, then it's issued what we call an approved type certificate. That goes along with what we call a type certificate data sheet. So the approved type certificate tells us that it has been certified and the type certificate data sheet lays out all of the specific information for that particular aircraft. As an example of what we're looking at, I'm going to take you over to rgl.faa.gov, which is our regulatory database uh, that we use quite a bit as well. I'm going to come over here to Type Certificate Data Sheets, and let's take a look at uh, the aircraft I trained in to get my license. We'll go by Make, Type Certificate Holder, 
This was a Piper Archer 2, so we'll come to Piper Aircraft under P, and I'm looking for the PA-28. As we scroll down, ah, there we are, PA-28, and it was Goodall 161. So, PA-28-161, made by Piper Aircraft, has a TCDS number assigned to it, 2-Alpha-1-3. Now, this was an older aircraft. It was originally certificated under CAR-3, which, again, if you remember from yesterday, was a regulatory institution that was before the FAA. So it was originally certified under CAR-3, but then it was recertified under FAR Part 23, which, if we check our Part 23, that governs normal category airplanes. So the Piper Archer 2 is a normal category aircraft. So let's take a look at this type certificate. We click right here, we open up the PDF, and voila, here we are. This is revision number 60 of this particular type certificate, type certificate 2 Alpha 1 3. And you'll see all of the different information that we have defined here. PA 28 160, it tells us it is a 4 PCLM which is, uh, falls under a normal category. PCLM refers to a uh, seating configuration and a few other particulars about the aircraft that we'll talk about later. As we roll down this TCDS, we see all of the different definitions. We have the engine defined. It can use a Lycoming 0320, B2B, or D2A with a specific carburetor setting. It uses a minimum of 91 or 96 grade aviation gasoline. We have the limits, it has a maximum of 2,600 RPM for all operations, and it should produce 160 horsepower at that RPM. Our propeller and propeller limits, it tells us the manufacturer and model and the limits for operating that propeller. The specific spinner that's used, we have airspeed limits. As we continue to move down, we have our center of gravity range, which we'll talk about more in our weight and balance class. We have our empty CG range. We have our maximum weight for the aircraft, the weight that the aircraft cannot exceed to fly. Number of seats, the position in the aircraft at which they're installed. If you remember from aircraft drawings, we have our datum line on the aircraft and anything aft of the datum is referred to as positive arm. So it's noted by a plus sign. If it's in front of the datum, then it's indicated with a negative. So this is 85 and a half inches and 118.1 inches behind the datum after the, uh, on the aft side of the aircraft. Ba uh, baggage capacity, fuel capacity, oil capacity. We also have notes that are referenced at the end of our uh, data sheet here, which tells us a little more specific information. We'll take a look at that in a minute. We also have control surface movements, nose wheel travel, and the serial numbers for applicability of this particular portion. Now this is what gets a little tricky, is each type certificate, type certificate sorry, can list different versions of the same model of aircraft. You'll notice right here we're looking at a PA-28-150. The first one that we're looking at is a PA-28-160. It was approved October 31st, 1960. As I scroll down to the bottom here, into our notes section, it's a long TCDS, so we'll make the trip all the way down here. All right. So we have the beginning of our notes section. We have data pertinent to all models. Now this is something that applies regardless of what submodel it is. It applies to all PA-28s. This is our datum. So this tells us what the datum point is. In this case, it is 78.4 inches forward of the leading edge of the wing on straight wings and 78.4 inches forward of the inboard intersection of straight and tapered sections on semi-tapered wings. Don't worry if you don't know everything that's being discussed here. I'm just trying to show you the extent of information that we have. Additionally, when we make weight and balance measurements, we have to level the aircraft uh, for certain operations and certain measurements. So they tell you the leveling means. There's two screws on the left side of the fuselage below a window, and we stick a level on there to see if the aircraft is leveled. We have our certification basis, which is uh, originally with CAR-3, uh, 1956 was the first one that came along for this model, and eventually it was recertified under the current FARs. As we continue to scroll down, we'll see a little bit more information. Here we are. So, 
In this section, we have minimum equipment that's listed for the aircraft. Uh, according to the certification basis, we have unusable fuel and oil quantity for different models of this particular aircraft. We also have a few notes that are specific to each model. Everything about this aircraft, and this is really the point of what I want you to see with type certificates, every single thing about this aircraft that defines how it is going to handle in flight is covered in the type certificate data sheet. Now there are other things we may have to consult a POH, the Pilot's Operating Handbook, or the Aircraft Maintenance Manual for, but everything that defines how this aircraft is going to handle in the air, anything that could change the characteristic of how it flies, is going to be under the TCDS. We can also get information on uh, a couple interesting topics that we come up with in inspections and other things, uh, like what are uh, markings should be or what placards should be included in the cockpit or what our limits are that should be painted on gauges inside the cockpit. We also see things like control surface movements and uh, a few other notes that we have, but it's a very, very good repository for information. Now, the other portion I want to show you, as we take a look at our FARs back in 14 CFR, is we were just talking about an aircraft that falls under our normal category. Now, we're going to take a look at part 21 because this is what entails the whole certification basis for these aircraft. Now, the thing that makes this interesting, at least for me, maybe not for you, hopefully it's interesting for you, but the thing that makes this interesting is we have a couple different options when we certify an aircraft. We know that we have to be approved by the FAA and each aircraft must be approved that has been built within those specifications. Now, what that would mean, for instance, for Piper Aircraft Company, is every time they make a PA-28, the FAA would have to come inspect that specific aircraft as it rolls off the manufacturing line so that they can determine that it conforms with the type certificate data sheet that's been already approved for that model of aircraft. However, there is one exception to that. Something that an aircraft manufacturer can apply for is what we call a production certificate, which you see listed right here. Those production certificates effectively govern the way that the manufacturer is building the airplanes. Everything from the tools and materials they're using to the condition of the facility where they're being produced. What that does is it saves time and money for both the manufacturer and the FAA by allowing the FAA to effectively say, okay, you've already approved this model of aircraft, so we're going to inspect your facility, and if we can guarantee that you're going to make every single airplane of this model the exact same way, then we'll issue a production certificate, which means as soon as that aircraft rolls off of the assembly line and you do your finishing inspection, then it can automatically get its airworthiness certificate because we already know that it complies with the standards that have been set forth. Now, I mentioned a term a couple times that may be unfamiliar, and that is airworthiness and airworthiness certificate. Now, what an airworthiness certificate is, it's a document that's carried in the aircraft, and effectively it's kind of like a, a title or registration for your car. It identifies the aircraft as the one that is uh, certificated under the appropriate part of the FARs. So again, using our PA-28 as an example, when it is type, certificate, type certificated and it conforms with that, it can be issued an airworthiness certificate. That airworthiness certificate lives inside the airplane and it certifies that that aircraft conforms to everything we saw over here in Type Certificate 2 Alpha 1 3. Now that's a lot of information to take in all at once, but that's kind of the nature of federal aviation regulations. There's a lot that's going on here, but if we can learn how to navigate it and use it to find the information we need and get a lot easier. There's only a few areas that are really advantageous for you to memorize. A lot of this is usually something you have to look up. And honestly, in most instances, it's not the person who can just memorize the information that's the most valuable. It's the person that knows where to find the correct information. So if you can figure out how to navigate the FARs, then you're going to be way far ahead of a lot of people that go out into the industry. It's a big challenge for people to understand. Now, on the topic of airworthiness certificates, there's two different kinds that uh, we talk about uh, in terms of approval. The two types, or the two uh, uh, sections we have, 
uh, are all dependent on the uh, category that the aircraft falls into. So, as an example, this PA-28 that we were just looking at falls under a normal category. In this case, that is going to fall under a standard type certificate. It's going to fall under a standard type certificate. That standard type certificate covers a number of different aircraft, and it's the majority of what we see listed in subchapter C. So our normal category, our transport category, uh, normal category rotocraft, transport category rotocraft, and manned free balloons are all going to fall under the umbrella of a standard airworthiness certificate. However, there are a different kind, the other type that we use, that are referred to as our uh, special airworthiness certificates. And those fall into the categories of primary, restricted, limited, provisional, special flight permits, and experimental certificates. Now it's a lot to list off right there. And again, you don't have to worry about memorizing every single portion of this. But let's go take a look at part 21 that talks about our certification basis here. And we'll take a look at what we're defining here. So you'll notice that in part 21, section 21, it talks about the issue of type certificates for normal, utility, acrobatic, commuter, transport category aircraft, manned free balloons, special classes of aircraft, yada, yada, yada. That all falls under a standard type certificate or a, a standard airworthiness certificate. However, our different kinds, our special airworthiness certificates, we see the categories listed over here. We have our primary category, restricted category, we have surplus aircraft from the armed forces, which is a different one, and import products, which both fall under restricted category. And then we talk a little bit later about our different styles with experimental uh, type certificates. Now, just to give you an example of what we're looking at, uh, let's see our limited category. Right, our limited category aircraft right here in part 21 section or uh, yeah, part 21 section 189 so an applicant for an airworthiness certificate for an aircraft in the limited category is entitled to the certificate when we have a couple conditions it shows the aircraft has been previously issued a limit, limited category type certificate and the aircraft conforms to that type certificate and and being the key word here Number two, the FAA finds after inspection, including a flight check, that the aircraft is in a good state of preservation and repair and is in condition for safe operation. And then there's the subparagraph that indicates the FAA can describe limitations and conditions necessary. Now, again, this is a lot of legalese, but this is really what we're looking at. When we read any information that pertains to uh, airworthiness, when we read, uh, read anything that talks about type certificates or categories, this is where it's all defined. This is really what we need to focus on as mechanics because this is our basis for work. This is what we have to reference. If you are making a logbook entry, if you're being investigated or if you're being interviewed by a FAA examiner, you can't say, well, this is what the 8083 textbook said. That's not going to cut it. We need to reference the actual federal regulations to understand this. And the reason we have these different categories, there's a lot of airplanes that do very normal jobs. There's other aircraft that do very strange jobs, like firefighting or uh, agricultural spraying or things like that, uh, banner towing. Those really can't be certificated under the regular umbrella of a normal airplane because they're just going under different physical stresses. So we have those different type certificates. We have those different uh, categories of aircraft to be able to have a number of different options and different regulations for aircraft doing different jobs. So as a final portion here before I cut you loose to work on your assignments for today, I want you to be very, very familiar as much as you can be with both the uh, ECFR website, which I've shown you here, as well as uh, rgl.fa.gov. You're going to use these quite a bit to research information throughout this class and honestly through the next two years. As you're in this uh, uh, a and school, there's a lot of information where we have to reference what the federal regulations are. So get familiar with both of these. The assignments I've given you are designed to help you become a little more familiar with this. 
One other thing that I want to talk to you about that's mentioned, and they don't go into a great deal of detail, is supplemental type certificates. Now, supplemental type certificates are important because they cover a different area. We know that when an aircraft is designed, it has to conform to a specific type certificate. But what happens if you come up with a really neat idea that would make the aircraft perform better for what you're doing, like uh, a short takeoff and landing kit, or a different kind of propeller, or some de-icing boots, or something that would really help out the aircraft? Under normal circumstances, you can't just put it on an airplane like you would install aftermarket parts on a car. There has to be a basis for how we certificate those parts so that the FAA can regulate that it's going to be safe and we avoid people just putting whatever they want on an airplane. That's where the supplemental type certificate comes in. Supplemental type certificates are an amendment to the original type certificate. So effectively, let's say I come up with a really, really great idea and we engineer this modification to the PA-28. I have to go through the FAA and submit to them my engineering basis for why this is safe and why it's functional. The short version of this is, if the FAA agrees with me, then they'll issue a supplemental type certificate. That supplemental type certificate allows me to deviate from the original type certificate for that aircraft and make those modifications with that different equipment, but still be considered in compliance with the type certificate for that aircraft. This is very, very important, uh, especially from a research standpoint, because oftentimes we see aircraft, and whenever we inspect an aircraft, whether it's for a return to service or for an annual inspection or a 100-hour inspection, what we're really trying to do is determine that everything on that airplane uh, has been done in accordance with our regulations pertaining to maintenance, so Part 43, and more importantly, that that aircraft conforms to the type certificate that was originally issued to it. If we find equipment on there that is not part of the original equipment list or has been added to the aircraft, then we need to be able to find a supplemental type certificate that supports why that particular component has been installed on the aircraft and what makes it legal to do so. That's 90% of our job is inspecting for compliance and then determining what we have to do to bring it back into compliance or determining that the aircraft is still in compliance with its type certificate and we can send it on its way. I hope this has been interesting. We'll have some different videos coming up for the next few lectures, so look out for that. If you have difficulty with the assignments, please send me a message and I'll try to help you out as much as I can. Take care.